Hello everyone, thank you for coming. Welcome to this session of NATO's 36th Annual Conference. On your attendee screen, you will be able to enter comments and questions in the audience chat. We hope you will take advantage of this opportunity to engage with our speakers. We recognize and thank our Petabyte sponsor, the California Healthcare Foundation. All conference sponsors have virtual booths available during the conference in the sponsors section. At the booths, you can learn more about the sponsors, review materials, request contact, and collect game tokens. We hope all attendees will take a few minutes to visit each sponsor's booth. Now I will turn the stage over to Norm Thurston, NATO's Executive Director, who will start today's session. Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to have you back for another exciting day here at NATO's 20, 2021, our 36th annual conference. Uh, before we uh, get into our remarks, I want to just maybe point out a couple of highlights from yesterday. First, we want to congratulate Erica Plant and Tracy Treasure, who were the two winners in the day one drawing from the, from the token hunt game. And uh, we will announce more winners this afternoon. And then again, the grand prizes will be awarded tomorrow. We want to especially thank the Peterson Center on Healthcare for sponsoring today's plenary session. We're excited to have them as one of our key sponsors, and we're thrilled that they are interested, continue to be interested in the work that is happening among health data organizations. Uh, another highlight from yesterday, um, all of the sessions are now recorded and available. So uh, the platform is working better than we expected. We thought that it would take at least a day, but uh, it looks like that most of those recordings are, are being available within an hour to two hours at the end of the session. So if, you're, if there's something yesterday that you really missed, you want to catch up on that, feel free. Uh, those, those recordings are available and out there. So now I want to bring to the stage Joe Porter. Charles, can you bring Joe to the stage with me? So Joe Porter and I work together. We are the co-chairs of the APCD Council. The APCD Council is a program here at NATO that we operate in partnership with the University of New Hampshire. And Joe and I are the co-chairs of the APCD Council. Um, and Joe is going to take a few minutes to talk to us about something really exciting that she has spent her summer working on. <laughs> so uh, I think m many of you know, but not everybody knows that Joe Porter, Niall Brennan, and Stefan Gildemeister uh, are part of our NATO leadership team, and they were all on the Department of Labor's State APCD Council Advisory Committee, or the SAFDAC, or however you want to pronounce that very long acronym. So we've asked Joe to come and give us an update as to what's happening with Department of Labor, what's happening with the committee, where are we, and what do we know and what do we not know? Great. Thanks, Norm. So, um, you know, I, I would, we had hoped that we'd have some uh, really robust updates to give at this session, and we're not there. I'll do a little bit of regrouping just briefly, because I know we want to get to our plenary. Um, but for those folks who are unaware, the advisory council that Norm mentioned was established through legislation that was passed at the end of 2020 as part of the Consolidated Budget Bill. Um, and Section 115 of that included um, some focus on state APCDs um, we continue to recognize that the inclusion of that in the legislation is a, is a real um, testim testament to the great work um, that states have done using their all-payer claims databases and that, that continues um, to be potential for uh, moving change in the healthcare system. And we heard a lot yesterday from, uh, from Jay Watt and his presentation about you know, the, the opportunities that exist around there. So that legislation had several components, a couple of particular ones of uh, import to this group. One was the advisory council that was established, was established largely to create recommendations for the Secretary of Labor um, related to the flexibilities and the authorities that may exist within labor to help states fill the gap for their ERISA covered self-funded data. Um, and make recommendations for the voluntary submission of that data to states. Um, the other big component of that uh, legislation was, <coughs> excuse me, um, the establishment of a grant program that will allow states to either establish or improve their state all payer claims database. Um, and that guidance around those grants uh, is something else that we're waiting, that, awaiting the details around. Um, at the federal level. 
Um, importantly, you know, one of the things that we recognize within that legislation is that the, those grant dollars were authorized but not yet appropriated. Um, and we are coming up, as, as many folks know, on a federal grant, uh, excuse me, a federal budget year. So we continue to wait to see how those grant dollars will be appropriated, you know, where within HHS they might they might end, ultimately end up. Um, and then obviously the details around those grants. So again, you know, I think we had hoped at this point to have a little bit more information around that. Um, we don't, uh, and we, we continue to wait. On that advisory council, um, we met over the course of uh, several months, um, really intense time, um, heard from a variety of stakeholders um, from the data collection side, from the data submission side, from the employer side. Um, and the, the focus of the committee was in four major areas. One was around the format of the data submission. Another was around process. Um, another was around privacy and security. And, um, and then, excuse me, <coughs> the last really focused in on the, the nature of the voluntary submission. Um, and those um, recommendations really sort of fall into those four major areas as well as sort of an umbrella recommendation that um, this work is not complete after the advisory council's recommendations are done and then there continues to be some need to work with DOL to implement um, recommendations as they exist. So that set of recommendations and that report went to the secretary um, at the end of July. Um, they were set to be released sort of any day now and uh, I actually just followed up with the DOL today, it's just, just in case we had a true late breaker, um, and, and we don't. So the report is still in the review status at the secretary level in labor, um, and you know we don't have any update around that. I will say that there was a tremendous amount of uh, recognition and respect to the work that state APCDs are doing today as far as how data are being collected, stored, used. Um, there were some recognitions of gaps in that we've talked about for a long time as this community around the data and um, and some you know opportunities for um, working with a variety of folks including employers um, employer representatives to try to strengthen the relationship between state APCDs and employer communities to support um, better voluntary submission of data. Um, so more to come on that. I think that'll be a big focus of work that happens over the course of the next year. And we're, again, anxiously awaiting both the finalization and the publication of that report, as well as um, more information about the, the uh, official appropriation of the grant dollars and then obviously the implementation of that grant program. Well, thank you. Thanks for the report. Thank you for right. the update. Um, and we are now going to just smoothly transition into our daily plenary session. Uh, this is a special one for us because this is a crossover session that we plan to jointly with, with NASHP, the National Academy of State Health Policy and our good friends over at NASHP. Uh, and this exact material or something very close to it was presented at their conference last week. And we have the same speakers, same topics this, this time. So we're excited to move forward again, thanking our sponsor, the Peterson Center on Healthcare for sponsoring today's daily plenary. And I'm going to just turn the stage over to Joe and I will see you at the, on the back end. Great. Well, thanks. I'm glad to still be here. We have our sessions that were recorded um, prior to just ensure that we didn't have any technical glitches with you all receiving the content that we have. And then we're going to do uh, questions and answers live with our panelists. So with that, uh, I think we can start the recording playing and we'll join back up in just a few minutes. Um, it is the value of data and the value of healthcare. Um, and I think we're gonna find a lot of really important information about high profile uses of APCD data and other data as well. Um, and then we'll come back together as a group to answer your questions. Um, none of our, present, our presenters had enough time to, uh, to tell them, tell the full story of the work that they did. So we welcome your comments and your questions at the end of the session.
Hello, uh, my name is Jessica Yazer. I am a data analyst with the Michigan Value Collaborative. And today I'm going to talk to you about how we're using claims data in Michigan to try to get more patients to go to cardiac rehab. Uh, I'll be joined by my colleague, Mike Thompson for the Q&A portion. And these are our disclosures. This is the agenda that I have in mind for this talk. First, I'll explain a little bit about cardiac rehab and its benefits, then the collaborative quality improvement model launched by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. I'll talk about my organization, the Michigan Value Collaborative, and how we use data reporting and engagement to improve cardiac rehab participation. So first, what is cardiac rehab? It is a secondary prevention program, highly beneficial for patients who have had a heart attack, or chronic heart failure or other kinds of cardiac procedures. Uh, it consists of 36 one hour sessions during which a patient receives education, counseling and supervised exercise. The American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association and Million Hearts together set a goal of 70% participation, which means they want at least 70% of all eligible patients to go. Cardiac rehab is undeniably a good thing. It's been proven to lower the risk of future cardiac events, to facilitate weight loss and improve eating habits, and it saves money by reducing hospital readmissions. Unfortunately, we have not met that 70% goal. Cardiac rehab rates vary widely by institution and by heart condition. The figure on the left shows hospital level variation for different types of cardiac conditions and procedures. Each dot represents a hospital. So you can see some hospitals send zero to 10% of their patients to cardiac rehab. A couple hospitals are successful at sending 60, 70% of their bypass patients to cardiac rehab. But in general, there's wide variation. There's a lot of room for improvement and enrollment trends haven't changed that much over recent years. And a problem like this is what the Collaborative Quality Initiative or CQI model was built to solve. So in 1997, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan started funding CQI coordinating centers, uh, which are usually topic specific groups that collect and analyze data benchmark performance and facilitate engagement between healthcare providers. Uh, each CQI creates their own value-based reimbursement and pay for performance metrics. There are now about 25 CQIs and most have a unique clinical focus. There's one focused on obstetrics, one on diabetes, one on opioids. Uh, the one that I work for is the Michigan Value Collaborative. And we do not have a specific clinical area of focus, um, but we were established in 2013 and we've grown to include 99 hospitals and 40 physician organizations throughout the state of Michigan. Um, there are 20 team members who work at the coordinating center based at the University of Michigan. And our purpose is to improve the health of Michigan through sustainable, high value healthcare. And we wanna see people accessing the right care at the right time, at the right cost. And one tool that we use to accomplish that is administrative claims data. So we receive claims data, not only from all Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan and Blue Care Network plans, but also Medicare fee-for-service. And most recently, just this year, Michigan Medicaid um, so adding all of that up, we have claims data for about 80% of the insured population of Michigan, or 8.4 million covered lives. We organize all of this claims data into episodes of care for 40 different medical and surgical conditions. And an episode begins with an index event that can be an inpatient hospitalization or an outpatient procedure an episode also includes all the healthcare utilization that occurred in the 30 or 90 days after that index event. So that means all professional services, post-acute care, or readmissions that occurred in the month 
or three months after the index event. So the strength of MVC data is that you can tell not only what happened within the four walls of a single institution, but also what happened after, and even if it happened somewhere else. So if a patient utilized home health services or a skilled nursing facility or rehab, if they were readmitted, where were they readmitted, when and why, and how much did it cost? We can answer all of those questions. And we share this with our members on an online registry. So our, our members can go online and see the data for episodes that started at their institution. They can view their data in comparison with other hospitals in their region, uh, with peer hospitals throughout the state, or all hospitals throughout the state that are in MVC. And the data are risk adjusted and price standardized. So comparisons can be made across time and geography and payer. So you can see now uh, how administrative claims data is useful in addressing a problem like low cardiac rehab utilization, because we can measure hospital by hospital, episode by episode, who went to cardiac rehab and who didn't. Um, but of course, you can't make change with just data alone. You have to have partners who are experts in the clinical details and experts in policy details. So we partnered with two other CQIs uh, with the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan Cardiovascular Consortium, um, BMC2, that's focused on cardiology, and the Michigan Society of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgeons, the CQI that's focused on heart surgery. Uh, we all came together to start a campaign to equitably increase participation in cardiac rehab for all eligible individuals in Michigan. So every six months, we distribute these hospital level reports to 47 hospitals throughout the state. Uh, these reports detail cardiac rehab use, trends, average days to first visit, average number of visits, we started doing this in November 2019, and we're about to distribute our fourth volume very soon. We also host virtual meetings with stakeholders from around the state, everyone who has an interest in solving this problem. So that means heart surgeons, cardiologists, exercise physiologists, professional organizations, and our payer partner, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. We all wanna see the same thing, so it's important that we work together, collaborate with each other instead of competing with each other. In the future, we would like to continue to study and eliminate the barriers that we know exist for cardiac rehab, one of which is out-of-pocket costs. So you can imagine if you have to pay a $25 copay 36 times to complete cardiac rehab, that adds up to a lot of money. Um, so we're engaging with our payer partners to try to address that problem. We're also looking into measuring virtual cardiac rehab in claims data because during the pandemic, some hospitals in Michigan have actually uh, started offering cardiac rehab over Zoom. So we're trying to figure out how to measure that. The three takeaways. Um, first, multi-group partnership is possible and useful and worth all the challenges. Two, administrative claims data is an extremely valuable tool. And three, we hope we are on our way to making improvements in care for Michigan patients. So I will leave it there and thank you for listening. Great, thank you so much, Jessica, and welcome Mike also to the, to the floor. Um, we have time now for a couple of questions uh, before we move to our next presenters. So I wanted to uh, move to the chat. I'm sure you can see them, but I'll, I'll announce them just in case anybody's in audio only mode. Uh, first, our question from Sylvia Hobbs on a little bit of clarification about who is in your data set. 80% um, of the population, uh, Sylvia is just asking for some clarification about that voluntary submission and, and whether that means that you've got 80% of uh, ERISA data as well? Yeah, that's a good question. So 80% um, is not just the Blue Cross population of Michigan. That also includes Medicare fee-for-service and Michigan Medicaid. Um, 
the other part of the question, I will have to defer to Mike. Yeah, so um, it's um, our data are a little bit different in that we kind of collate data from different resources. So we are not like a health information exchange or anything like that. We actually receive raw claims files from Blue Cross and purchase data through Medicare uh, and then have recently developed a relationship with Michigan Medicaid where they also provide us with raw claims files. So um, that's how we primarily get our data. The 80% is kind of a back of the envelope based off of the number of unique beneficiaries and the number of adults that we have living in Michigan. But then for, for the most part, that commercial claims that are voluntarily submitted to the system don't have restrictions on whether those are your um, self-funded or fully insured Michigan Blue Cross claims. Is that right? Right. So they're all okay. they're all beneficiaries from Michigan. And, and um, we, we have specific data use agreements with Blue Cross and how we can use those data. So um, that's it. how we have access to that. OK, great. Thanks. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Sylvia. Um, feel free to ask any clarifying questions in the chat if that didn't. Uh, John Stewart asks uh, a little asking a little bit more about the Michigan Value Collaborative. I know we didn't give you a whole lot of time to describe yourself or your organization. So maybe we could take a minute now. Um, and you could talk a little bit more about that, the collaborative itself. And um, John's question was specifically about your revenue model, which I'm like, assuming will come out a little bit more in the history if you're given the opportunity to talk about it. Sure. Um, so I could talk a little bit about that. So um, we're, we're not a private enterprise company. Um, we are uh, funded directly from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Uh, our coordinating center is technically housed within the University of Michigan, uh, so we sit within their uh, within their administrative framework. Uh, Blue Cross more or less funds these independent collaborative quality initiatives, uh, specifically around uh, hiring staff and, and resources to uh, collect data, run engagement activities, and kind of drive quality improvement uh, through their value partnerships program. Uh, so the services that we provide all of our all of our um, all of our members are free. So we do not charge hospitals in Michigan for the data we provide or the reports that we provide or any of the engagement activities. Uh, so those are all part of the, the collaborative quality improvement model is that it does not cost anything to participate. Uh, and, and there are financial incentives for hospitals and, and uh, others to, uh, to join our efforts and, and be a part of those. Great, thank you so much. Okay, uh, the next question is around lag time. Everyone's favorite data question when we talk about claims. Uh, a question a little bit about what that lag time generally is, and then maybe if you could talk a little bit um, just about whether or not that lag time seems to have much impact on um, the utility as you all work through some of these questions with your collaborative. Yeah, I can take that question. Um, so the lag time depends on the payer and for Blue Cross beneficiaries, we have data um, going back just a month, but we have to also think about the time it takes to build out an episode like I was talking about. We have to um, account for that run out time, that 30 or 90 extra days. Uh, so even though we technically have data from Blue Cross um, for August, we can't build those episodes out yet because those 30 or 90 days are still happening right now. Um, and then for Medicare, our lag time is six to nine months, uh, which is significantly longer. And the lag time is one of the most challenging things, uh, trying to make claims data useful. Um, we often say that even, you know, we, we have a, a lesser lag time with Blue Cross patients, and hopefully you're not treating your Blue Cross patients radically differently than you are treating your Medicare patients. So mm -hmm. the information that we can give you about your Blue Cross patients should still be applicable to the other payers as well. Great. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have 40 seconds left when we might want to take that 40 seconds and shift over to our next present presenter um, and hold. I know um, both Mike and Jessica are going to hold on till the end of the session in case we have more questions about the Michigan Value Collaborative, the cardiac rehab work, um, or claims data in general. So we're going to hold here and we will move now to our session um, with our uh, colleagues from Mathematica, Carrie Ann Wells. We'll provide the presentation and then similarly um, 
add Marianne Robel for uh, questions and answers. And we'll hear again another example of the value of data for improving the value of care, this time focused in on cost driver analyses. So with that, we will shift over to um, our presentation from Carrie Ann and again, do some questions in between that session and our final presenter and then come back all together for more questions. So if you are digesting the mic and just the content and you have more questions, you still have your opportunity to ask those. Good afternoon. My name is Carrie Ann Wells. I am a health researcher at Mathematica. And today I will be talking to you about using Connecticut's all payer claims database to understand drivers of healthcare cost growth in Connecticut. Um, specifically, I will be focusing on inpatient spending and emergency department utilization among the commercially insured population. Um, so quick background, Connecticut is charged with monitoring healthcare spending growth and with establishing benchmarks. Connecticut's Office of Health Strategy or OHS partnered with Baylet Health and with Mathematica to begin to understand cost drivers in the state um, using the state's all payer claims database. So we're taking a phased approach to this analysis. When we started out last year, we were looking very broadly and we discovered that inpatient stays and emergency department utilization were areas for further exploration. Um, so um, I'm going to be sharing those results with you today, um, but currently we're also drilling a little bit deeper into those analyses. So I'll also be previewing a little bit of the methodological enhancements that we've made and give you some tips for using APCDs to um, research cost growth. So in this study, we are looking at a somewhat narrow population, although it is an all payer claims database, we um, started out looking at the commercially insured population, so we're not looking at Medicare or Medicaid. Um, generally speaking, self-funded plans are not required to report data to APCDs, so we are not looking at self-insured um, residents here, we're just looking at Connecticut residents um, with fully insured commercial insurance. Um, we're looking at under age 65, and um, we're looking at primary medical claims, which means we are not including pharmacy claims. Um, furthermore, we are looking at claims costs only, um, so we are not able to observe things like capitated payments or incentive program payments. We're looking between 2015 and 2018, although in our current analysis, we did expand that out one additional year to 2019. What we see here is that uh, between 2015 and 2018, the number of inpatient stays among this population went down by 4%. Um, however, among the same population in the same time period, a cost per stay went up by 26%. Here we see a very similar trend, except we're looking at somewhat different measures. So per member per month spending on inpatient care grew by 22%, um, while um, utilization went down 4%. Um, so this is why this is really of interest to OHS in Connecticut as an area um, for potential reduction in cost growth. So here we are trying to really disentangle the different drivers of cost growth. So we know that there were fewer inpatient stays in 2018 relative to 2015, but maybe those stays became more complex, maybe they became more severe, and that could be what's driving cost growth. Um, and so the way we do this is that we use uh, Medicare severity diagnosis related groups. These are um, DRGs. And um, essentially, we look at the distribution of stays across DRGs, um, looking only at those DRGs with 10 or more cases. And when we look at the raw um, mean change in spending per discharge, we see a 28% increase. Um, however, when we hold DRG distribution constant um, at 2015 levels, we observe a, a mean 20% increase. And so from this, we extrapolate that about 8% of the 28% increase in spending is due to case mix or to the severity of hospitalizations um, becoming worse. And that's about one quarter of, uh, of price growth that we're attributing to um, case mix. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, we are continuing to dive deeper into these analyses and carry them forward to 2019. 
Most importantly, what we're doing on the inpatient side is trying to look at specific hospitals and health systems and how they contribute to cost growth um, so that Connecticut can kind of identify those facilities that are most driving um, increases in spending. Next slide. Um, one of the challenges with APCDs, though, is that uh, it's not necessarily straightforward to align a claim to a hospital. So if you do want to do this type of research, um, you do have to do some upfront data cleaning and data enhancement to make sure that the facility claims that you're interested in are uh, aligned to um, acute care hospitals. So I'm going to segue now to emergency department use. What we see on the emergency department side is a 1% um, decrease in volume coupled with a 23% increase in cost per EV claim. So similar to what we saw on the inpatient side. Again, we're looking at two more indices and seeing the same trend of costs going up while use goes down. Um, so these next three slides I'm going to go through somewhat fast, but what we did is we took um, U.S. Census American Community Survey data and we appended to the members um, record based on their zip code some indicators of their community. So we attached um, median income, for example, and then what we did is build deciles um, uh, so that we could do some equity analyses and see if we could observe um, disparities based on your community profile. And what we do see here, if you look at um, income decile one, which is the lowest income decile, we have 805 ED claims per 1,000 members. And among the highest income decile, it's only um, 322. So we do see some disparities there. Um, this next slide shows the same sort of trend, except here we're looking at chronic condition prevalence. And um, we use the chronic condition warehouse algorithm um, to assign chronic conditions to members. And we do see higher chronic condition prevalence among lower income deciles. Um, so that could be part of what's driving their higher EP use. Um, we also affixed uh, some racial variables from the U.S. Census so that we could look at um, potential disparities by the racial composition of a, com a member's community. And we do indeed see um, some disparities by uh, that indicator as well, although they're not as pronounced as with um, median income. Um, so we are continuing to drill into these findings, um, see if we can um, identify areas for potential uh, ED use reduction. Specifically, we're looking at potentially avoidable ED use using the John Billings algorithm. We're looking at some specific diagnoses such as non-traumatic dental care, um, and we're really focusing on equity. Um, one enhancement that we did decide to make on the earlier slides, we were using a one individual emergency department claim as the unit of analysis, but oftentimes, when a person goes to the emergency department, you might end up with a professional and outpatient claim in that one visit, for example. And so we decided to group claims based on having the same member ID and same date of service so that we could kind of build emergency department visits. Um, we think this is a more valid way to, uh, to measure ED use. Um, that did result in a drop in the number of units, of course, um, from what you saw previously. We also dropped emergency department uh, visits that end in admission. Um, and so those are, um, those are also going to cause the, the costs that you saw previously to go down a little because those do tend to be somewhat costly. So um, in conclusion, um, APCDs are a very rich resource uh, for identifying opportunities to reduce cost growth. You have the ability to look across commercial um, uh, and public payers like Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, you can um, drill down into regional geographic detail. Um, you have person level data, which is uh, very useful if you wanna look at frequent flyers, for example, or you know, look at a, a particular age range or a particular type of, of patient. Um, however, um, there are some limitations to using APCDs that I've touched upon here. Uh, we generally don't have data for self-insured people or for uninsured people. Um, we don't have non-claims data. So again, if you have capitated payments in a managed care situation, generally speaking, those wouldn't be in the APCD at this time. 
Uh, we do have some challenges attributing facility claims to hospitals and health systems and usually have to do some work to um, kind of group claims into the kind of uh, analytic unit that we're interested in, like an ED visit or like an inpatient episode of care. Um, we don't find that race and ethnicity data are very reliable at the person level, and so that's why we decided to use um, the U.S. Census and look at more of a community level. Um, and finally, we have some lag between when a claim occurs and when you're able to um, view it in the APCD. Um, so that concludes my uh, presentation. Thank you very much, and we can move on to the um, Q&A portion now. Great, thank you. Um, and welcome, Marion, also to the stage, to the virtual stage to help with the question and answer period. Um, thank you, Carrie Ann, for bringing that forward. We do have a few questions um, in the chat, so let's go ahead and get started with those. Um, a little bit of a, a question around um, changes in case mix and, and how much of that is real changes in severity versus what um, could be happening in provider coding practices. Do you have thoughts about um, interpreting those changes, either you know, in, in thinking about that from a policy perspective, and also any ways to sort of validate those things with audits or evaluations? Sure, I'll, I'll do my best. And, and you're really kind of touching in on the challenges with uh, with you know trying to work all this out using claims databases. Um, it's not a perfect indicator. Um, we did look at like length of stay as a as a um, as like another indicator of severity, um, but we think that case mix on the inpatient side does a pretty good job of controlling for you know changes in the type of hospitalization. Um, I don't know that we can observe you know coding practice differences in claims, so I think that there's more that we you know would like to see. Um, to really try to drill down on this. But in terms of what's available in the APCD, we do feel like that um, the DRGs are a, a good way to control for case mix. Yeah. Marion, you might have thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll add a few words. Um, you know, Carrie alluded earlier to the fact that this is kind of progressive work where we um, dig more deeply into topics of interest. And I certainly agree with um, Carrie that once you standardize the mix of DRGs, you are um, making comparisons that um, are reasonable, but certainly APCDs would allow um, further controls around chronic conditions or demographic factors that might um, let you get a little bit more of a bead on changes in severity. The, the other thing that I want to add is that I know that the Health Policy Commission, um, which in some sense is OHS's since across the border in Massachusetts. I know they've done some work on provider upcoding. I'm not uh, an expert on what was done myself, but that could be a way to see what a similar agency had done to drill into the question. Great. Okay. Thank you. So we have a couple questions, both related sort of to the complexity of what might be happening within inpatient stays and also in the ED. So let's start with Sylvia's question. Hopefully we'll have time for both. And if not, we'll move on one of these to the end, which is, um, did you explore any of the shifts in inpatient acute care volume uh, associated with increases in observation stays or activities that um, would typically be performed in an inpatient stay that moved into an observation stay? Um, and, and then, you know, similarly in that in acute care inpatient um, experience, those that may have ended in death or uh, discharge to hospice. Yeah, I, unfortunately, we didn't uh, really look at those things, to be honest with you. Um, we had a very aggressive timeline, so you're bringing up some things that I think we would love to, to dive into and, and some really good um, 
you know, p potential explanations for some of the patterns we saw, but I, unfortunately, I don't, I don't know any, I don't know um, that I can answer your question beyond that. Yeah, but trying to put um, the positive spin on it, these are the types of questions that all pair claims data databases can answer and the previous presentation sort of gave a nice um, example of how you can follow a patient from one event in one institution to another event in another institution so um, the half full part of the glasses it's possible the um, not yet full part of the glasses that we didn't get there on our timeline okay so I'm, I'm told we have about a minute left. I would like to bring this question forward because I think it, it aligns nicely from a methodology standpoint with what you were just talking about, which is again, those complexities in these stays that we're looking at. And Carrie, you mentioned specifically that the um, this didn't count ED visits that led to admissions. Can you talk a little bit about whether or not you were able to take a look at some of the complexity of those ED visits and things that may have spanned multiple days um, and you know whether that had any bearing in your methodology for what sort of counts as an ED visit that did or didn't have um, an admission related to it. Yeah, um, actually, the the Connecticut All Pair Claims Database makes this sort of easy for us because they have a flag for emergency room uh, claims, and then they also have. Uh, you know, claims coded to inpatient and outpatient using claim type setting and place of setting and stuff. So we were very easily able to identify emergency department visits that ended in admission just by looking for both that ER flag being yes and that the claim was coded as an admission. And we basically thought of those as part of our as part of our inpatient analysis and that's kind of why we we took them out from the ed and by the way the data that you saw during the presentation did include those admissions but that was a an enhancement that we made in in our kind of follow-up um uh, research um but we we didn't look at uh, a time span of ed visits to be totally honest with you yeah okay. Well, I think one of the great things about every presentation is it leaves you with a list of other things you might potentially do later. So that yeah. certainly <laughs> is the case with the questions that arose so far. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Carrie Ann, for the presentation and Carrie Ann and Marian for uh, sticking with us for a few questions. Again, um, both Marian and Carrie Ann will be with us uh, after our final presenter so that if you do have more questions that come up uh, as you're ruminating on this information, they'll both be available for your further questions after. Our next presenter, who is Kyle Russell from Virginia Health Information. Kyle is the Director of Strategy and Analytics um, and incoming Chief Executive Officer. He's going to, again, bring us another example of the value of data for improving the value of care, this time focused, um, again, on the emergency department, but with a different viewpoint, which is around some care coordination efforts for those who find themselves in the emergency department and some of the activities that can be done to address those. So with that, we'll shift over to Kyle, uh, Kyle's presentation, and again, we'll take questions at the end. Hello, everyone. My name is Kyle Russell, and I am the Director of Strategy and Analytics and incoming CEO at Virginia Health Information. And I'm here to speak with you all today about Virginia's Emergency Department Care Coordination Program. And I've been really looking forward to giving this presentation for a couple of different reasons. One is, is that this has quickly become the single largest program or project that VHI operates in the Commonwealth in a very short period of time. And then second, as, as the title implies, we're able to generate really good results with this program. Um, and that's just not something that we've seen or been able to participate in the past. So sort of as, as my lighthearted second slide here implies, I mean, most of the time our role as a health data organization is to build these systems that measure how well other things are, are impacting healthcare delivery in our state and see what's making a difference and what's not. And, and so it's really awesome to also be, be participating and administering a program that's actually driving those results too. So th th that's kind of where we'll get at, at the end point of how we're, how we're generating these results. But you know, if, if we back up a bit to what the problem we're trying to solve is, um, I, I don't think many of you will find this slide particularly surprising, uh, which just illustrates that the number of ED visits year over year over year overall in the U.S. is increasing. 
And what we find is if you go one layer below that, a lot of what's driving that increase is a significant number of visits from a, a much smaller proportion of patients that have multiple chronic conditions that are just not being treated very effectively. The, the care coordination around them could be better. And if it was improved, then typically what we'll see is that those patients can be treated in a much a better setting of care that is cheaper and provides everything that they need in the same way. So that's why back in 2017, the Virginia General Assembly noticed the success that states like Washington and Oregon were having building what is called an emergency department care coordination program. The easiest way to describe this is that it is a real-time electronic notification system that links together every emergency department in the state to exchange information in real time. But then it also exchanges information in real time about those patients uh, with those, those patients' insurance carrier, their primary care provider, or other care coordinators around them. And so when this was set up, um, VHI had recently become the state's official health information exchange. And so they, they um, trusted in us to get this program off the ground. And we issued an RFP and it was very, uh, it was very easy selection in picking Collective Medical who had administered some of those other programs in other states to be the technology partner for the EDCC. So I expect many of you are familiar with VHI, but some of you might not given this is a crossover section. Um, we are a state health data organization. We're an independent nonprofit. Similar to many of you, we administer data collection systems since 1993. Think hospital discharge data, all pair claims database, some other systems as well. But what you might not know is, is as I said earlier, these, uh, via a uh, merger with Connect Virginia, we're actually now the state's health information exchange, and that has actually become the biggest part of what we do moving forward. So this slide is, is risky, I'm gonna tell you right now. So what I tried to do was kind of in my own words, describe how the system works. And this has not gone through any corporate approval pop process. So again, I, I'm taking some, some risk in doing this, but I thought, you know, hey, we're presenting this to an audience that, that's not familiar with it. Why don't I try to see how I can describe this, kind of how this works in practice. So, so this is me in the bottom left of the slide. And so let's say that I am going around to emergency departments all around Virginia, I'm going from one to another. And I wind up my next visit at the first facility for hospital incorporated system. And they see that. So the way that simply worked in the past is they, they probably have no idea that I've been going to all these other emergency departments before I got to their emergency department. And if I've been going from, from ED to ED, it's probably not that surprising, I might go across the street or across town to another facility within the hospital incorporated system. Now, even in the past, they probably would have seen that if it was in the system. That's not necessarily what we're trying to address, but okay, I'm not gonna stop there. I'm gonna go to another emergency department. Let's say this is the fifth emergency department I've gone to in the past year. This is really where the EDCC is gonna shine because it's gonna flag that via real-time electronic notification. If I go to that you know, fictitious good care LLC system, they're gonna be able to get information and know, oh, he's, he's gone to every single one of these different emergency departments. Even if I just went to facility two at that other system 20 minutes ago, they'll see what I was treated for, if I was prescribed anything, which gives them way more information to provide better care to me. But then the trick, right, is that not only is it going in between these different emergency departments, but you know, a copy or, or another, you know, a record of every single one of those visits is also being sent to my primary care provider, my health plan, if I'm involved with a CSB, maybe even a health department, depending on what's going on. And say my, my primary care provider sees that and can fill out what's called a care insight, like a mini care plan for me that can then be shared back. So when I showed up at Good Care LLC, they can see all those ED visits. They can also see that care plan. And that's going to stick with me even if, as I move forward so that all these different providers around me can work together to know what's going on and coordinate care to try to get me out of this pattern and go into the emergency department. So even if I go back to that original facility, everything is moving forward. Everyone knows what's going on. So you can't build a system like this at a small scale. So 
the, the legislation to create the program established a wide mandate. Every emergency department has to do this. All acute visits are on the network. Every uh, commercial MCO, Medicare Advantage Health Plan, they all have to be connected. There's a big base layer scale. But it's one thing to require it. But I mean, in a very short period of time, we got all of these entities onboarded so that we could start generating results and providing value really quickly. Okay, so another sort of late 80s, 90s uh, <laughs> reference. So I, I made this big claim in the, in the title slide of these great results that we were generating. So I told you about how the program works, but you know, let's kind of put, uh, let's put that up and, and talk through what some of the data that we're seeing looks like. So you know, it's one thing, like, so we have this broad mandate for these different entities to participate, but the, my, my PCP, or if, if I'm in an ACO or a post-acute provider, they don't have to, really. You've got to provide a value proposition to these entities to, to take the time to onboard into the system because they don't have to, right? And so what we see is even though they don't have to, everyone wants to be a part of this program. We're seeing significant growth year over year in the number of entities that are onboarding. And every single one that onboards adds collective value to everybody else. I told into 2021, we might even double or triple this in terms of the rate that we're going at. But, you know, that's just people that are onboarding to the system to kind of receive these notifications. But if you never log in or use the system, then it doesn't really matter either, right? So if we look at our baseline in 2019 for how often our network is logging in to view these records and, and contribute. Uh, you know, in, in versus 2020, we see a significant increase in, in trend, even though volume of certain things was, was down in 2020, right? But really the gold standard here is whether someone is putting in a care insight, again, a, a mini care plan for patients that have high utilization, multiple chronic conditions. That's our underlying goal to curb over utilization and hyper utilization of ED. Now, this is on a much different scale. We wouldn't expect this to be put in every time, but what we see is a very similar growth trajectory between years where adding a thousand care insights, that makes a big difference um, within the state. And the reason why in the callback to the title is what we see is that when those care insights are put into the system, patients that are going to the ED a hundred or more times in a year before and after that insight, a 33% reduction in utilization, which is huge. And what we also find is that for patients that have 10 plus visits, they're still getting a 20% reduction and there's a lot more of those as well. And so this is really holding up like, you know, for a lot of times when you're look, working with these big macro things, maybe a, even just a st statistically significant single percentage would be great, but we're seeing these really large reductions and really the program's having the impact that we want it to. But I, so the data is really strong and that's always been accompanied by the, these like individual experiences that we hear about from, from organizations that are on board. It's particularly behavioral health providers that say, there's no way we could go back to doing what we do and caring for our patients without a system like this. It's night and day, we regularly rely on this. It is built into our everyday workflows. So that's where we are. I think things are going really well, um, but we can't be stagnant. We still want to continue to grow this program and grow its impact. And so we have planned enhancements around state identified priorities such as substance use disorder, behavioral and maternal health. We've got upcoming upgrades to the system over the next year that we're going to be able to do. Uh, we can't be complacent with the number of entities that we have onboarded uh, into the EDCC network. We want that to continue to grow. Uh, we, we see the numbers that come out of the systems have been around a little bit longer in the Pacific Northwest. That, that's what we're striving to get to. And then lastly, what we see is the number one factor that drives utilization of the system and results is when we aren't involved really at all, is when you've got these regional payer provider collaboratives where the participants in the program, the plans and providers come together to develop best practices and standards and talk through how they're gonna communicate using that system then we see utilization go way up and the results follow. So um, if anyone's thinking about building a system like this in your state, given the results, uh, we can't recommend that highly enough. It is just sort of foundational piece for, for making sure uh, for driving your success. So that is uh, all I have for you all today. Uh, again, really appreciate the time and, and getting to speak about our experience and happy to stick around for the uh, Q&A session. 
Great. Thanks so much, Kyle, for that. Uh, again, we, uh, we have an active group. We have a couple questions in the chat already. So we will um, do these Q&As directly to you and then bring the rest of our panelists back for a broader discussion. Um, you alluded to this just a minute ago, Kyle, actually, in your presentation, and, and this might be a unique to Virginia kind of experience. There's a question about your ACO slash payer group, and, mm -hmm. and can you talk a little bit about that structure and why there's a sort of a, a bar in your bar chart that um, that includes those as a, you know, as a slash combined together. Right. So, well, first of all, let me apologize that uh, if there's any clear indication that these are recorded in advance. You'll notice my voice sounds much worse today than it did at the time of the recording. So apologies if anyone didn't know that. Um, so the, I mean, the real reason uh, to be totally honest is, you know, you only want to have but so many groupings on a chart like that, you know, it's not a, it's not a, um, a crazy delineation, but realistically it's because they're risk bearing like, and that's a big delineation in the program is, if you're a voluntary entity, are you bearing risk or not? Because that your participation and whether like a fee is triggered as part of your participation depends on whether you're quote a risk bearing entity. And so you might have some carve out pay payers that aren't under the mandate, even though it's you know run through the provider organization, they're still taking on this risk, and that's how they get categorized. Great, thanks. <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to move to one more methodological question and then go to another broader question about Virginia. On the methodological yeah. side, Milda asked, uh, what checks did you implement to make sure that the reduction that you see is not a regression to the mean? Well, the well, the big thing we hear, right, is like, oh, well, everything was down in COVID in 2020. Like, how do you know it's from that? The, the biggest thing is seeing the before and like 2020 is tough to evaluate. Right. And I realized that that was the biggest cleanest chunk of data that we have for this presentation. But you see the same trend in 2019 that you do in 2020, and it's even higher in 2021. I, it's, it's between 33 and 40 percent, I think. So uh, the easiest way to describe it is that it's consistent and it, it we see that over time, even when you sort of pre-COVID or post-COVID drop, like more normalization during COVID, we still see the same trend. Great. Thanks. And then Sine, and I hope I got that right. Uh, asked uh, more globally, I think, around the experience at VHI, um, what chance have you had to use both the APCD and the HIE data uh, in any of your programs, this one or others? We haven't, and that's, it's, I'm not proud in saying that, that we haven't done that yet. I mean, so we've got a ton of ADT data that's flowing through the EDCC. Uh, but we're, our intention is to change that within the next year. I mean, I'll tell you, I know for different states that are planning, maybe Hopefully, when we find out a little bit more about the uh, No Surprises Act funding, I mean, one of the projects that's going to be on our docket is looking at the linkage of those two systems to see probably more so claims flowing through the EDCC to, you know, provide insight at, at point of care um, or some of our other HIE related efforts. So I can't give you, unfortunately, an example we've done in the past, but it's like absolutely in our radar that that's a deficiency. And I expect that our presentation at hopefully at NATO in 2022 um that we will talk about how we did that you know during the year right well we might hold you to that kyle so That's you, you wait right. yeah hopefully i can tell you in person we'll see but, uh, <laughs> yeah, that would be that, that would be great yeah so we have one more minute kyle with um before we bring the rest of the presenters back in and i'm going to do a, right. a moderator um privilege and ask you a question a little bit more about the edcc and that work um yeah. have you had an opportunity to to look at um through that information that's been collected through the EDCC and the analysis sort of leading up to it, what kinds of, of uh, services or conditions were um, most frequently in that group of folks that had a lot of ED visits to maybe help you figure out whether there were sort of consistent gaps in care patterns or needs across Virginia? Right. So 98% so of patients with 100 or more ED visits have a behavioral health diagnosis. And a good chunk of that. So that includes substance abuse. And so that's the overwhelming driver. And um, and we know that and everyone else that's just seen the data knows that, too. And so we're drastically trying to add functionality um, around um, substance use disorder treatment and onboard every behavioral health provider in the state. Our behavioral health agency is, is engaged with that. So I, we've got a game plan. But I mean, it's like jumps off the page. I mean, it's almost every single one of them. Yeah. 
That makes sense. Okay, so welcome back, Mike and Jessica and uh, Carrie Ann and Marion. Thank you again for joining us. Um, now is an opportunity for additional questions for any of our speakers in the chat. I'll be trying to watch that uh, as we go along. Um, but while we're waiting for our, uh, our attendees to ask some questions, I wanted to reflect a little bit with all of you about um, something that Jessica said in her presentation, which I think is really powerful, which is you can't make change with data alone. Uh, I think that's a really important thing for all of us to remember. And, and certainly, you know, as we think about bridging our work with policy change um, and wanted to think a little bit with you all about, you know, we know that um, um, that sometimes you know the data brings along collaboration, but can you talk at all about how having these data improves that collaboration and and helps sort of gravitate um, a, a collaboration around sort of a common set of needs when you have sort of data to to ground yourself in? And um, maybe Mike and Jessica, you could talk a little bit about that from the Michigan Value Collaborative, and then we'll go around sort of the circle that I see on my screen. Sure, um, I'm happy to, to, to kick things off here. Um, I think a big a big part of it, at least with our experience, was that um, there is was a strong appetite for these data. Um, so I think these are very directed quality measures that providers are interested in, that patients are interested in. So I think there was a big appetite for this specific, you know, data. Uh, um, this project. So I think finding areas of common interest is really important and can get us started. Yeah, I, I agree. Having the data gives us something to talk about, right? It gives us something to actually act on. And um, we have stakeholder meetings, like I mentioned in my presentation, um, approximately quarterly. Um, and we always have a data element at, at one of those meetings because otherwise we are mostly sitting around lamenting um, why people aren't going, but it's more productive to, to have some data to back that up and, and to um, drive some hypotheses and, and some analysis to try to solve it. Great, thank you. Carrie and Marion, you wanna talk about your experience as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's similar to, you know, what Jessica has said that it's an opportunity for stakeholders to get together and kind of look at the numbers and discuss them and kind of coalesce around strategies that maybe are most palatable to everybody in the room, kind of as a first start. Um, you know, with OHS, they have a technical uh, stakeholder group and, um, and some other stakeholder groups that involve payers and providers. So that's an opportunity to kind of share these data and kind of discuss strategies um, that they can use to reduce unnecessary use or improve quality or um, bring down uh, cost growth. Thanks. Marion, anything you want to add from your experience? Yeah, well, I'll make a, an attempt to add two new points. One is that sometimes organizations <laughs> like ours um, can create data that's sort of everybody's data so that rather than having one person bring his data to the party you can have data that um, belong to the entire group that the group um, hopefully all had a say in the methods you know the methods are not proprietary and that um, can be an additional advantage that organizations like the speakers and I presume many in the audience can bring. Um, and the second point that I wanted to make is often um, the, the data do portray truths that are already known, but once we um, settle on things we're paying attention to and track them over time, we really can see if we're making progress. I mean, I, I appreciate the point before about regression to the mean. Sometimes um, these will be simple descriptive comparisons, not um, highfalutin econometric 
comparisons. Sometimes they will be highfalutin com comparisons, but either way, over time, I think tracking progress uh, and also maybe seeing what's getting worse is the second use. Thanks. Kyle, do you want to add anything? I think, you know, particularly with your perspective that, that you all started with a legislatively mandated or a legislatively drawn um, program. Right. I mean, so the two things come to mind for me in terms of driving collaboration. So one is, you know, all these big system state systems that we all work in, they always have advisory boards, right? It's very common. And, and so, you know, we have an advisory committee for the EDCC and a big task over the past year was essentially designing success metrics for the program. And uh, several of those had to dealt with like identifying how, how, what was the level of quality of data flowing through? And that was clever just because it got them really involved and helped everyone really like understand what was going on in the nuts and bolts of the program. Like it's something about like digging into the weeds of wondering like, is everything flowing through all right? Like, what do we actually see? Like, what are examples of things to fix? I think is really unifying and, and kind of opens up the lines of thought that everyone has on, on to make it a little bit more actionable and what to do. And then the second, as I highlighted up front in my presentation, like, it's so infrequent for us to get something where we have like clear results of like, here's a win that we have that if you can do that, like everyone is dying to tack onto that success. It's really easy to collaborate with that. People are coming to you left and right of like, can we do this? Can we use it for that? Can we use it for that? And it's not like we have this portfolio binder of a hundred different measures. It took one, you know, like that slide I showed, I've shown that a bunch of times and it's, it works really well of people saying, all right, well, what, let, like, let's, collaborate on what to do with this. So just, if you can just get some really clear, concise, like uh, a, a clear, concise win from something, it just makes a huge difference. Thanks. So Kyle, we had a couple more sort of methodological questions come up about ED use. Yep. And, and um, while, while you and, and then obviously uh, Carrie Ann and Marion, there are some ED use. I think any of yep. you could probably talk about methodology um, around ED because it's one of the things that, that folks talk about a lot. So uh, first one was around um, avoidable ED utilization and, and mm -hmm. ways to identify that. So any methodological thoughts that any of you have around avoidable ED visits? I can take but, that if that's okay, Kyle. Um, yeah, absolutely. We did, we did take a look at this in our more recent work and we actually use uh, the New York University John Billings algorithm. That's free and available online. Um, and what it does is it groups claims, ED claims based on their primary diagnosis um, into different um, categories. So um, includes a non-emergent, emergent primary care treatable and emergent ED care needed, but preventable, avoidable. And then there's kind of the emergent like that isn't avoidable. So it's a really lovely tool um, if that's something you're interested in. It doesn't capture every single claim, but it does get the majority of them. And it, like I said, it's free, so. Right. So two Anything? things for me. One is one of the measures we looked at doing for the EDCC was using the ADT data to analyze, uh, essentially try to do a reduction in avoidable ED visits. But the data didn't hold up. It basically didn't have all the elements everyone wanted to calculate it based on an existing methodology. So we had to drop it. We couldn't use it. The data didn't support it. Um, and so normally we use that on claims. And I mean, we use, it's originally from the California Department of Health. I think OHA is a steward now. We do that for our QE reporting. And, and it seems like NYU is like out of favor for a while, but now see a lot of people are saying, well, why don't you use that? Like in general, I'm shocked at the lack of consensus around what is like the industry standard metric for avoidable ED visits. So I guess all the vendors on the phone, like I think there's an opportunity there of like, they're still, we're all still kind of doing our own thing. And some, some methods seem to excel more in others, but um, I, the, so we have our flavor, but it does, it seems like everyone's kind of, there's maybe three or four that everyone's using, but it's not that there's still a pie chart there on who's doing what. All right. Well, yeah. I am. And I'm, I'm, I so sorry, Marion, I'm getting the you have to wrap by both Norm and Charles. And so when they both start yelling at me, I know it's time to go. So I wanted to thank you very much to all of our panelists. Um, thank you to the Peterson Center for sponsoring this session. Um, by the questions and the continued conversation, I think Kyle alluded that next year we would take this back up again um, and certainly in between right. then. So thank you all very much. Really appreciate your time and your energy. And we look forward to continued discussion. Great. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thanks.